The Montana Heritage Tour is a six-part series featuring mostly small rural museums. This project is a joint venture between the Montana Historical Society and Helena Civic Television. You can find cultural and historical treasures no matter which way you travel across the Big Sky State. The nice thing about starting in Helena is that when you drive out of town in any direction, you're going to find gold. In this edition of the Montana Heritage Tour, we're traveling first southeast from the capital city to the edges of the Beartooth of Sorca complex of mineral-rich mountains, where ample history resides. First stop is the Carbon County Historical Society Museum, located smack dab in downtown Red Lodge. When you enter the Carbon County Museum, you learn right off the bat that rodeo families are a unique and important feature warranting big displays. The museum's assistant director, Joan Goralnik, supplied the details. Actually, we have two rodeo royal families, the Lindermans and the Greenos. The Lindermans, they were all rodeo champions in this area. We have the um, Rodeo of Champions is the name of the rodeo here in Red Lodge. They traveled, all of them traveled all over the world. They won championships in Madison Square Garden. They did stunt, um, stunts for movies in the, West, the old westerns. Alice Greeno was very big in the mu movies, had uh, several feature shots, traveled in Europe, uh, met the Queen. Uh, they, uh, Alice ended up starting the museum in the area. Her father was Pack Saddle Ben, who, Pack Saddle Ben Greeno, who um, asked her to set up a place for all of these wonderful treasures that everyone had collected over the years. Um, and then eventually it moved to the Labor Temple was gifted to the Historical Society and Museum and it, it established a home here. As we talked further about the contents of the museum, Joan revealed that the building itself has a storied history. The Labor Temple was built by volunteer labor and funds. In 19, it opened in 1909. It was the local work union for the miners and other skills. Um, the bottom floor started out as the Kalava Mercantile, and the second floor was accessed through a uh, back entrance, and they, the Labor Temple had their bar there, they had their library there, meeting rooms, that's where they would have their union meetings. Um, and it also had one of the few shower facilities in town. So the miners after work would be able to come up the back way, not bother the mercantile, take their showers and have their drink, meet with their friends before they went home for the, after their shift at the mines. The third floor was a grand ballroom and it had um, the tin ceiling, elegant lighting, had a stage facilities. Um, and then went into disuse in the 60s. It was used as a roller skating rink. And we actually have the sign for the roller skating rink with all the lights and everything on it. And our plan is to reestablish its grandeur. We need to bring it back and, and turn it into a community event center. As Joan mentioned, the hugely impressive ballroom on the floor above the main collections area awaits its restoration. On the way, we caught a glimpse of the backstage area where lots of the stuff is stored. Always a welcome treat at museums, large and small. Joan introduced us to a new word, accession, which has to do with adopting an artifact into the museum's collections after verifying its authenticity. Our goal is to provide a repository for Carbon County history, whether it's for display for people to come in to look at the exhibits and learn something that way, or whether they want to come into the workroom where we have 
uh, we have a wonderful photo archive where, that we've digitized so people can actually look through the photos. We have um, news, old periodicals and newspapers on mi microfilm and people often come in to research their families and their local history here. As viewers of this series have learned by now, every small museum houses some larger-than-life characters. At Red Lodge, we are entertained by images of liver-eating Johnson, a real mountain man and a constable, no less, who allegedly gnawed on the innards of his Indian enemies as a means of getting revenge for the murder of his wife. Liver Eating Johnson is one of our characters. He was the constable for Red Lodge. Um, the county seat was, if he were to arrest someone, he would have to take them into the county seat, which was not Red Lodge at the time. And he didn't want to, so he often dealt with justice in his own unique way. And no one will actually tell me what that unique way was, but you know, he, I guess he had his ways. He also, the kids loved him. He always had stuff in his pockets for them and he wore these big huge coats that we have an example of and he would sneak the kids into shows under his coat. Um, so he, he was quite the character. Um, if asked, he, he, was, he got the name Liver Eating Johnson because he was, during the, he was in the military and he was told, said to have eaten, eaten the liver of his enemies after they were killed. And later on, when asked if that was true, he just kind of shrugged and said, that's what they say. Debbie Brown is the Historic Preservation Officer for Carbon County. She told us about some of the techniques she employs in her job, and also related the joys that come along with genealogical research and sharing the results with visitors from near and far. Here, my job is a lot easier than other areas that are just starting out because we've actually had a preservation office since 85 and 86. And it's my job to make sure that new industry that comes in isn't detracting from our historic flavor or significance in any way. Um, if somebody wants to redo or remodel a building in one of our historic districts, it's my job to be kind of the liaison between here and the state to make sure that they're not taking and ruining something we've already nominated to the National Register. So it, it covers a broad area. Family history is a big part of why people come in the front door. And it's fascinating to search for somebody's ancestors and be able to hand them a name that they never knew before. So, and we all take part in that in here. Anybody that works here does. Ironically enough, we start out with what we know. We have a good indexing system and either the name is in there or it isn't. Um, we redirect through government records like birth and death and marriage records. Um, we have a lot of old newspapers on microfiche. And if they want to spend the time reading through those, you'd be amazed at what they write in the old papers that you can find. So there's a lot of things available to us um, that you know we just start with what they know and go back from there. I think that when somebody finally reaches the point where they stop in and ask somebody at a museum, um, they're already have been curious about their family or their heritage for a long, long time. And if you can hand them a piece of that that's tangible, um, I don't know who ends up being more excited, me or the customer, <laughs> I really don't. I have always, always believed that in order to know where you're going, you have to know where you've been. And family history does that for a person on a lot of different levels. I researched for a family out of California that actually visited me in my office one day. And there was a great aunt with three sisters and her traveling companion and some of their children. And I had been researching their name for about a year and I was passing paperwork around and all of a sudden the great aunt let out a holler and started crying and I thought, oh, I've done it now. She was holding her own birth certificate. She had never, she was 82 and had never until that moment had her own birth certificate and I had found it for her. And so I know they were all thrilled, but I was just ecstatic to think that I could give her just that little something that meant 
the world to her that I took for granted. So it's, it's very rewarding work, very rewarding. If I could leave anybody with anything, I would tell them to look in their backyard first and find out what's gone on and where they've been and where they've come from because when you lay a good foundation your future is easier to see and understand and I think you accomplish more. I've always believed that you have to know where you've been to know where you can go. Red Lodge was once a major site for mining chromium for the war effort and also for coal. The Smith Mine Disaster of 1942 is thoughtfully commemorated at the Carbon County Museum. There was an explosion. Um, there was some buildup of gas. A um, section of the mine had been sealed off and the gas built up and at some point it escaped and exploded from the work that was going on. Probably a spark set it off. Again, the display downstairs will tell you we don't really know, but um, I think it was 74 miners were trapped and killed and um, it pretty much shut down the mine for, for the time. Um, some people got out at the last minute, but uh, and everybody pitched in to try and dig people out, but there, there was no chance. Following our visit to Red Lodge, we stayed in pursuit of hard rock mining themes and discovered a rich lode at the Museum of the Beartooths in Columbus. Penny Redley is the executive director at the museum. She told us about a Norwegian family who played a large role in the development of the local area and also introduced us to a notable artist and her work. Isabel was an accomplished artist um, and she taught and was head of the art department of Eastern Montana College, now MSU Billings, and um, she um, donated, when, when she passed, she donated all of her artwork to um, the Yellowstone Art Museum and all the family artifacts here, but we recently have been don given um, her studio art furniture, um, which we have on display here. Um, along with some loaned uh, original paintings of hers. One of the unique features of this museum is a display area devoted to the second to last hanging in Montana ever in 1938. It's a bit grisly, gruesome, and clever all at once. When exhibits are relatively simple, it's easy for small things to leave an impression. For example, that's a rather nice shirt to be hanged in, really. Viewing the execution, was by invitation only. The hanging exhibit is the last legal hanging in Stillwater County, the second to the last in the state of Montana. Frank Robidoux um, shot and killed Mike and Frida Kuhn some day after Thanksgiving in 1937. Um, must have ran out of ammunition and then turned and pistol whipped their five-year-old son and left him for dead. In the exhibit, we have the original hood and rope that Frank Robidoux was hung with, uh, as well as the um, revolver um, that he did the dirty deed with. Just a couple years ago, Larry Coons, the five-year-old boy that was left for dead, um, came to the museum for the first time, came back to Montana for this area for the first time since the, the hanging and saw the original photographs that we house in the archive, the um, evidence photographs. And, and the exhibit, and, and that was quite an interesting time. His whole entire family came here. Um, he also gave an oral history of that day, of what he remembered, which was quite amazing. The great-granddaughter of Frank Robidoux, the guy who was hung, um, she came to visit the museum, and, and she too looked through our archival items and whatnot. She's trying to find clues and, and find more out about her great-grandfather. And so she came here and then I was able to get her together with Larry Koontz, who was the five-year-old boy um, who was left for, for dead. And um, just got a note from them the other day, actually, that they had a wonderful visit. 
we had an unexpected virtual encounter with a Hollywood celebrity, Mel Gibson. We have a, a World War II era military uniform from, that was used in the movie We Were Soldiers. Why is that here? Well, um, Joe McCloskey, who was the uh, wardrobe supervisor for the movie, lives north of town and has since 1996. And he came in and asked me if uh, we would like that uniform and, and I jumped on it um, for two reasons. First, because Joe lives here, and I could tell some history about him being a, a wardrobe supervisor, and because this uniform was worn by Mel Gibson, who owned the Beartooth Ranch here in Stillwater County for about 16 years, um, just a little ways out of Columbus here. So it's kind of fun to have something like that because the kids can relate to Mel. It's a little known fact that the second Crow Agency was located in Stillwater County. Penny explained the significance of this fact and its memorialization here at the Museum of the Beartooths. This um, history is important, of course, to the Crow tribe. Um, this, all of this land here was part of the Crow Reservation originally. Um, some important things happened at this site. Um, and, and, you know, there's a lot of people that are really interested in the Indian War period and all that type of thing. Well, you, you know, beyond um, the Bighorn Battle and all that, there were things happening around this area that, that um, led up to that battle. So this site was where uh, Bradley came to recruit some of the Crow, the Crow Scouts for um, to, to go with Custer and with them. So, you know, um, th that piece, and then, and then there's an, another um, important date in March, I, I believe, of 1881, where the Crow people at this site decided to be reservation Indians. I mean, it is, to me and to, to I know a lot of others, it, it's just such important history. Penny's enthusiasm for the Crow Agency history extends to the significance of mining in the area, then and now. Well, m mining, of course, was a, a, a big thing in Stillwater County um, prior to Stillwater County's existence. And um, the, we had the Mowat Mine, and, which was a chrome mine. Um, there were some coal mining and that type of thing going on, but more recently, um, the Stillwater Mining Company, which is the only platinum and palladium mine in the Western Hemisphere, um, is in our county. Um, they too support the museum and we have um, a mining exhibit that tells the history of mining in Stillwater County and brings it to the present to show um, what, they, what they do at the Stillwater Mine and, and how they mine. Board members play an important part in all small museums. Chuck Egan reflected on some special features at the Museum of the Beartooth. Well, there's one favorite of mine. It's a young man by the name of Harris that was riding in a rodeo in Absorkey in 1923. He made two rounds, bucked off, and was in a coma. And in those days, they would pick someone to ride for you. So the guy they picked was the right one, so he won a saddle for him, and we have that saddle. We also have a, a wonderful picture that I have great admiration for and it's a full scale, six feet long, couple feet wide. And I guess the reason that it caught my eye was because we had some of the elders in from prior and uh, they came and picked out a lot of their grandparents and great grandparents that were in that picture. So it was kind of fun in that regard. But there's so many things in here and I, I guess the good thing about it is the way they're displayed. They're concise, they're unique to the point and uh, people wander through here and, and just have a ball. We even had a busload of Norwegians in here the other day, and they were really interested. They couldn't speak English, which was fine. We communicated anyway. I don't speak Norwegian, but uh, it was fun to be with them for an hour or so on their trip. But a lot of people stopped by here, and I guess the thing that really impresses me because of my background in working with youth is that there's hundreds of students that visit this place and uh, do some, well, they do a lot of things in meaningful ways. They're writing books, 
They're studying various exhibits and writing a lot of stories about our history and culture and arts. And uh, that means a lot. And besides, it brings in mom and dad and grandma and grandpa for later visits. And I think that's important. But we really believe in ownership in this place. It's open to the community. We do all in our power to strive to cause people to come and see us. That's the name of the game. Before taking our leave from this splendid facility and setting, we asked Penny what motivates her to do the work she does. What, what motivates me? Well, um, I have no uh, background in museum work, but I've always, always loved um, museum work and, and that type of thing. And it goes back to when I was 12 years old. I was actually going through my grandmother's photographs with her and wrote in pencil on the back the names of everyone, which, you know, I always have been proud of my Finnish heritage and, and I've been doing this work now for um, going on 15 years and I just, I just love it. Our last stop in this leg of the heritage tour was in Harleton, northeast of the Crazy Mountains in the Muscleshell River Valley. Harleton is a windy place with a rich history of railroad traffic and related human endeavor. We rode a slow elevator to meet up with Robin Lodi, the curator of the Upper Muscleshell Museum. The largest part of the facility is housed in what used to be a motion picture theater and now contains an eclectic array of artifacts, furnishings, a two-headed calf, and the inevitable dinosaur skeleton. This one has more than one name. Her official name is Aviceratops Lammersai. Aviceratops is named after one of the paleontologists who discovered her, and then Lammersai is named after the family whose ranch it was found on, the Lammer Ranch, which is which who owned the Careless Creek Ranch. And she's a juvenile, and her unofficial name is Ava. <laughs> And we've had several kids come from a thousand miles away to come see her because their name's the same as her name. <laughs> Harleton has a lot of early railroad development in its story. And the positioning of its streets and buildings is closely tied to the arrival of the locally famous electrified Milwaukee Road. In 1914 or 15, the, it had turned to electric here in Harleton and went clear to Avery, Idaho. And the reason they did that was because with going over mountain passes, they had to use a lot of brakes, which used a lot of steam. But by the time you heat it up in the winter, it was really hard to regulate that. So they had the brilliant idea of doing electric, and it was self-generated. So when they were going downhill, it was generating electricity and storing it into the substations and then when it go uphill it would take from the substations to power the engines. As you might expect many of the visitors to the museum are railroad fans. Kids especially are drawn to the working model train and the extraordinary collection of model railroad cars. The guy that helped us put this collection together, well actually he should get credit for putting it together because he, his name's John Shantz and his family was deeply rooted into the Milwaukee Railroad. So, and they're from Harlow, so he had this idea of getting a collection of cars together that had passed through the roundhouse here in the Harleton yards. And that's why we have this huge collection of cars. The folks who support the museum have come up with a special way to attract financial resources. The upstairs floor features heritage rooms, which commemorate specific families with deep roots in the local community. We needed funding to open up our upstairs in the Marshall Building, which is the building we're in now. So our the board president at the time had visited a previous museum that had done this before and the idea was to sell space to families so they could decorate the space with their family artifacts and 
with the money that they used to purchase the rooms, we were able to fund finishing up the upstairs of the Marshall Building. And they're responsible for their space and decorating it and keeping track of their artifacts. Nobody else is allowed into the room except for certain people that are on the papers. A lot of people come in and say, oh, my family has a room upstairs and then I direct them upstairs to show them which room is theirs and a lot of, you know, when we have a lot of family reunions in town, I, there's a lot of people that come and see the family room and they really like it. The upstairs of the Marshall Building used to be a series of apartments, so they had the idea that, well, why don't we just restore one of the apartments to the 1950s style and leave it as an exhibit. And we have two volunteers, Lynn Graves and Char Charla Hatfield, and they were the ones that put it together, and I think they did a really fantastic job of doing it. <laughs> People really love that that 1950s room. We only had time to explore the main museum building with Robin, but she gave us a quick rundown on what there is to see in the smaller building across the street. In the, our Times building we have music, uh, office, <laughs> farming and ranching, kitchen, dishes, clothing, schoolroom, <laughs> 1800s living area, and toy room. I think I got them all. Thanks for tuning in to the Montana Heritage Tour. In the upcoming and final episode in the series, we take a trip to the northwest quarter of the state to visit museums in Whitefish, Libby, and Polson. timber workers and millwrights, the small business owners and the captains of industry. They are the hands and the minds, the shoulders and the backs that made Montana. And we're proud to say that we see them in more than just museums. We see them in the people we continue to serve today. Montana State Fund, proud supporter of Montana's museums and the Montana Historical Society.